Hey, welcome back, my fictitious physics students. Um, we've been looking at rotational motions. We're talking about spinning things. And one little concept that always comes up over and over again is um, the idea of um, Newton's second law. So what is Newton's second law? And it seems like in physics, everything relates to Newton's second law, at least in um, what we would call Newtonian mechanics, which is what your introductory physics classes cover. And so Newton's second law, and in one of the other videos, we showed how you could derive um, all of the equations we'd done so far into Newton's second law and all the equations about um, space and orbital motion and gravitation and those kinds of things. So Newton, Newton's second law, second law sorry, equals the net force equals a mass times acceleration, right? So that means that any force that you put on a mass, which is um, a force that exceeds the other forces pushing it back, um, indicating a net force will cause an acceleration or cause that thing to move. Pretty simple idea. And we're talking about moving around a circle, right? We have the same idea. And so we just learned in the last video that what causes a force around a circle is a torque, right? And so we use that kind of squiggly T or whatever. But a torque um, equals the force, right? It's a Newton meter, and it equals the, it is the force that causes something to rotate. So that's a torque. So, um, so that is, is really a net force, is a torque, Right? Um, now, when you're spinning around a circle, you also have mass. You know, let's say this is our mass that's spinning around. But mass isn't the only thing that's taken into account when you spin around a circle. You also have the length um, or the distance from the center of that circle that you're spinning around. And we use the example of the seesaw in the last video where if you have a uh, heavy person, right, um, and you have a light person, well, you can... You <laughs> You can, you can get them to even out. So here's the heavier person. Um, okay, this isn't going to work. This is exactly backwards. So the heavier person has to move in. So, so this isn't going to work. The heavier person is going to make this go down. But if I take the heavier person, you can see, I drew them with a little belly over here, and you shorten the distance, and now this is going to equal. This torque is going to equal this torque. And so we find that um, it's not just mass. It's also distance from the center of rotation. So we have this other concept called a moment, um, and a moment of inertia, or just plain old moment. We're going to call this moment of inertia. And what the moment of inertia is, and we call that I in physics, is in this case, say we have a point mass like this, it's going to be the mass times the radius squared. Right, and so the moment is actually what takes the place of mass in circular motion. So I'm going to have torque. So my Newton's second law equation for circular motion is going to be torque in the place of force. And it's going to be moment of inertia in the place of mass. And then in the place of acceleration, I'm going to have angular acceleration, which also takes into account the radius as well. So all these things are moving in a circle, and so things are slightly different, but still, we basically have an equivalent statement of force equals mass times acceleration in rotational dynamics as torque equals moment of inertia times angular acceleration. Now, you've probably wondered um, when you see, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this very well, but let's say this is the ice skater, right? And you see on the Olympics where they go into the spin and they have their leg out, and then when they pull their leg in, let's see if I can, I can do this with the leg pulled in, and uh, they spin around. This is kind of more pointed, and so they're spinning around. And so then they also bring their arms in, right? And um, and they spin way faster. So this, and when they first go into the spin, they start spinning kind of slow. And then when they pull everything in, all of a sudden they spin faster. Well, what's happened? Well, if you notice that um, this mass of this leg is way out here, right? And so that moment of inertia is going to be um, more. Um, and let's define moment of inertia a little bit better. It's actually resistance to torque. So what's going to happen is um, <clears throat> it's going to cause this person to go a little bit slower, 
right? So it's going to resist the torque in that sense. And so it's going to cause the person to go a little bit slower. As soon as the ice skater pulls this leg in, she's going to change the radius, and that's going to cause... And so the actual effect is that the moment of inertia is changed. And so when the moment of inertia is changed, when she brings the skates in, she reduces this radius, which actually changes then this. And so if my torque remains the same, so my torque isn't changed, let's say my, my torque is 10, sorry about that, my torque is 10, right? Let's say my initial moment of inertia with the leg out was five, so that would make my, um, my acceleration two. So what if my torque stays the same? What if I change my uh, moment of inertia to two? What does that do to my acceleration? Well, it increases it to five. So what you'll notice is that these skaters, when they spin, um, they, will, they will go and start spinning faster and faster and faster and faster. And you may have wondered how they did that. Well, they simply did that by having a rotational motion and using Newton's second law, they changed their moment of inertia by having their legs out to begin with and then bringing them in um, and their arms as well. So sorry my drawings are so bad, but um, just real quick to sort of sum this up and show you how you would use this in a physics problem, I'm going to do a quick little example problem for you real quick. So here's what I've outlined, this idea of spinning a top. So let's say that we have a top. And uh, the top, of course, is a solid mass. And so we know that a solid mass for the moment of inertia, if you look um, in your books on a charts, different moments of inertia have different, um, different formulas. So it depends on how the mass is distributed. So if we have a solid mass like this, my moment of inertia, did that again, my moment of inertia actually equals one half times my mass times my radius squared, right? That's my moment of inertia is going to equal for a solid spinning disk as opposed to a point mass, which is where you have all the mass around the outside circle. Okay, so this is my top. So I, I have a eight millimeter, um, eight millimeter shaft in the middle, and uh, we're going to ignore the moment of inertia for that eight millimeter shaft, and um, we're going to calculate the force on um, the string in order to get the 3.5 centimeter top to spin at a velocity of 3 meters per second given that the mass of it is is um, is 0 0.0125 kilograms um, so so that's kind of that that's the problem right here so um, let's go ahead and, and do that and uh, see how far we get so I'm gonna go with a, a different color here just for fun so so some things that we've learned so far in this is that torque right equals force times distance, okay? So um, we have some distances. Uh, we want the force, so we have to solve for torque. So let's also look at uh, this equation right here. We just learned that torque equals the moment of inertia times the angular acceleration. So what do we have here? We have an, a change in angular velocity and a change in time. So we can actually solve for that angular acceleration from that. So my change in angular velocity, um, actually, you know what, this is a linear velocity right here. So when we look at this uh, velocity, I forgot that I did that, that's three meters per second. So um, we have to know the um, equivalency of linear velocity to angular velocity. So when you're going from linear velocity to angular velocity, you have to include the radius. So the regular velocity, if you're going to change to angular velocity, um, equals uh, the radius times the angular velocity. So let's go ahead and do that. So then if the velocity is 3, uh, my radius on my, um, my little uh, spinny thing here is, uh, well, it's 8 millimeters in diameter, so we got 0 0.4, 0 0.004. So we got to change this to meters, 0 0.004 meters. Um, times my angular velocity. And so what's that going to give me? That's going to give me a total um, angular velocity of 750 radians per second. Um, <coughs> Right, so um, so that's my angular velocity right there. So I've got 750 radians per second. Um, now, what can I do with that? Well, my angular velocity. This is going to be a change in angular velocity. So I went from zero to that in 0.50 seconds. So if I went ahead and divided that by my time, 
that's going to give me an acceleration because angular acceleration equals my change in angular velocity divided by my change in time. And uh, so if I go ahead and divide that out, I get 1,500 radians per second squared. So that's going to be my angular velocity. That's not very good. Uh, Yep, that's good. All right, so that's that. So what do I need to solve for now? I've got my distance. What I'm looking for is my torque. So what I need here is my moment of inertia. Well, I'm going to ignore the moment of inertia for this little tiny shaft and just um, use the moment of inertia for the, for the big one. I could calculate it for this little tiny shaft, but uh, since it's so small, my guess is that it's going to not really matter. Um, and so we're just going to use uh, the uh, full 3.5 centimeters there. So, um, so I talked about earlier how the moment of inertia for a solid shaft is um, one half mass times uh, radius squared. So my mass is 0 0.0125 kilograms. And I'm going to divide that by 2 and then multiply that times my radius squared. So my radius is going to be point, well, it's, this is my diameter, so let's go ahead and do this, 0 0.035 divided by 2, and I'm going to square that. So I want a, a radius out of this instead of a diameter. So that squared divided by 2, go ahead and calculate that out, and I get something like 1.91 times 10 to the negative 6th. All right, so so that's my that's my inertia. That's my moment of inertia. Okay, so that's um, so that's what I what I have right here. So now that I know my moment of my inertia and my um, angular acceleration, all I'm going to have to do then is multiply that times my 1500, right? My 1500 radians per second squared, and that's going to give me my torque. So go ahead and multiply that, and I find that my torque uh, equals 0 0.00285. Uh, newton meters. <clears throat> so now that I have my torque, I can figure out the force on this string. So the force on this string has to be a force that is big enough on this distance of this shaft, because remember when you're doing the top, you pull on the string, which spins the whole thing. So this is my distance right here, my point um, zero zero 0.008 divided by 2, or point zero zero 0.004. Right, so um, so my torque is going to equal 0 0.00285, right, and that's going to equal some force times my distance, which is 0 0.004 uh, meters. Um, go ahead and divide this by this, and I get my force to be 0.7125 newtons. Okay. There it is. So that's the amount of force that I need to put on the string in order to turn this top. And that kind of shows you um, an easy way to take a little bit of data and use a good bit of the things that we've been talking about so far in order to solve for um, a force uh, question. All right, so I hope that helps. And um, I will be doing more examples to come as we integrate things like equilibrium.